Okay, so today's topic is the Fourier transform. Okay, so last time we talked about the Fourier series, which only applies to periodic signals, right? But a lot of times the signals we care about in real life are not periodic. And so um, today is what we do in those cases, the Fourier transform. And so just as a refresher, the idea of the Fourier series was that I have some sort of a periodic signal with period T that, you know, the definition of periodic means it re repeats every T units, right? And what I did was I wrote that like the combination of a bunch of other simpler periodic signals, which turned out to be sinusoids, right? So I basically said A0 is like multiplying by a constant term. A plus or minus one is like multiplying by complex sines and cosines that oscillate once in this interval. A plus or minus two were like complex sines and cosines that oscillated twice in the interval, and so on. Yep. So what do we do when our signal's not periodic, right? Um, well, an aperiodic signal would basically look like just something where I don't have any copies. So let's think about that. Um, what about an aperiodic or a non-periodic signal? So that's just like I have one lonely thing in the middle and no copies, right? So. The way I think about this for the Fourier transform is I get there by imagining that I have copies that are infinitely far away. And so what I do is initially I may take this signal and I, you know, make some copies of it and I push those copies out to infinity. And the idea is that in the limit, the Fourier series coefficients somehow becomes this magical thing called the Fourier transform. And so let's think about that for a second. The Fourier series representation was the following, right? This is like saying what I do is I take a bunch of sinusoids, complex sinusoids, and each of these sinusoids has, you know, a different frequency, k omega zero, where omega zero was two pi over t, right? So what happens when we have a sign, what happens when we have a signal where t is very large, right? When t is very large, that means that omega zero is very small, and that means that the sinusoids that I'm adding together are actually very close together in frequency, right? And as t goes to infinity and omega zero goes to zero, that means that fundamentally this sum will turn into some sort of an integral, right? So eventually these things are so finely spaced that what I will have is something like a continuous function of frequency where I have something times e to the j omega t dt, right? Where instead of sampling uh, the frequency axis super finely, suddenly I'm just kind of having a continuous frequency, right? And what goes in this box is going to be the Fourier transform, and we're going to derive how that works, okay? And so first let me be a little bit more precise using one of the signals that we talked about last time, right? So last time we talked about the square wave. And that square wave was defined like this, where again, my period is capital T, and let's assume that I have a, you know, a pulse train, and the width of this pulse is, you know, plus or minus T1. Okay. So what we showed last time, or what you can show, is that if I want to rep represent this square wave in this fashion, for your series, the coefficients turned out to be these sinc functions. Okay. I think that in last time's notes, we didn't get to exactly this because I assumed that T1 was basically half the interval, but this is the general form. And actually, you're going to need to use this on your homework in problem one. You can take it for granted that these are the Fourier series coefficients of the square wave. Okay. And so one way to think about this is let me bring my t over here to the other side so I can say that t 
AK equals 2 sine K omega 0 T1 over K omega 0. And then I can kind of write that as this, 2 sine omega T1 over omega evaluated at omega equals this thing. So what, what that means is that to get the AKs, what I do is I take this continuous function of omega and I sample it every omega zero units, right? So if I want to draw that picture, it kind of looks like this. What I have is, is a continuous function of omega. Make this look better here. So what I have is this continuous function of omega that looks like a sinc function. Kind of a crappy sinc function there. And to get the AKs, what I would be doing is I would be sampling this function, this continuous function, every omega zero units. Right? And so that's a nice way of thinking about how the Fourier series and the Fourier transform are related. It basically says that the underlying thing is the Fourier transform, right? And to get the Fourier series, I sample the Fourier transform at these equally spaced values, okay? So the kind of intuition, and I'm going to derive it more properly in just a second, is that, you know, intuition, you know, the AKs are... evenly spaced values of this continuous function of omega. And as t goes to capital infinity, I'm sorry, capital T goes to infinity, omega zero goes to zero, and samples get, you know, infinitely close. <laughs> Right? So if I wanted to push the copies of this square wave off to infinity, eventually what I would have would be that these samples, instead of looking like this, would look more like this. And the limit, I actually am basically getting every point along this continuous function. Okay. So this is the basic idea. Let, let's actually mathematically derive how this works. But first let me stop and ask if there are any questions. Okay. So, here is the way we go about this. Let's assume that we begin with our non-periodic signal, okay? So this is the thing that we want to take this new quantity of, the Fourier transform of, okay? So, what I can do is make a related signal, right? So let's assume that the signal has finite extent for the moment. That means that there is some capital T large enough that I can make copies of the signal way out on the x-axis. So I can take this signal and I can create periodic copies of it for some capital T. Okay, and let's call this signal x tilde of t, right? It's related to x, but not the same as x. And these copies don't overlap, okay? So now I have a signal that I can take the Fourier series of, right? That's from last time. So this is a periodic signal, and I can say that my uh, x tilde of t is going to have some Fourier series. So what are the AKs going to be? Now I have to use my other formula, the uh, analysis formula, to figure out what the AKs are. Well, let's figure that out. So the AKs are going to be 1 over t, whatever that is, this integral. I'm going to choose, just because the way I drew the picture, this interval of length t. And here's the integral that I have to do, okay? 
And now I can look at my picture again for a second and say, okay, well, this integral over one period of this signal, well, for the purposes of this integral here, I can just replace this tilde with this actual x, right? Because in this range between minus t over t and t over 2, these two signals are exactly the same, right? So I can replace this by just this. And now that I've replaced that signal like this, I can say, well, if I'm going to integrate this from you know, minus t over 2 to t over 2 of the original signal, well, I'm assuming the signal is 0 outside that range, right? So I don't lose anything by turning this integral from here all the way from minus infinity to infinity, right? Nothing is lost because all I'm just adding is 0, right? So that's the same thing as saying 1 over t, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of t, like this. And now what I'm going to do is let's define this guy, x of omega. You already know, actually, that this is going to be for your transform. But let's define this, OK? Now I look at this thing, and I say, well, this guy here is kind of encapsulated here. What I can look at this and say that this is basically like 1 over t <coughs> times this continuous function evaluated at k omega 0, right? It's like saying, I pick, whoa, wood lighting. I pick the particular frequency k omega 0, and I plug it in for this. And you can see that then the two integrals match, right? And so this kind of makes explicit the fact that the AKs are related to this continuous function x omega. Okay? And in some sense, you can kind of think about this as like an envelope. Right? I have this continuous function, and what I get for the AKs are samples of this envelope. And that's kind of what I tried to draw in this picture, right? Here I've got this continuous sync function as the envelope, and my AKs are kind of sampling inside that envelope. Okay. Okay. And so now, fundamentally, I have the AKs. And what I want to do is I want to plug back into uh, here, right? So now I figured out what the AKs are for this signal. I want to reconstruct the signal from the Fourier series coefficient. So I'm going to plug in what I just learned about the AK. So what I just learned was that the AK was like 1 over t times the sample of this guy at k omega 0. And then I have e to the j k omega 0 t. That's the way I put the signal back together. OK. So let's just remember, so omega 0 is 2 pi over t. And so that means that 1 over t is equal to uh, omega 0 over 2 pi, if I just move the 2 pi over, right? So I'm going to replace this by a omega 0 over 2 pi. I'm going to take the 2 pi out. I'm going to have x k omega 0 e to the j k omega 0 t times this extra omega 0. And so now I've got this sum. Right? So what does that sum really mean? Well, let's think about it. Again, let's suppose that I define, you know, what is this thing? Let's think about uh, a function. I'm kind of going to cheat and draw this like it's a real function, but it's really a complex function. So let's think about a function that is defined as x of omega e to the j omega t. Okay. So what is this thing inside the box? Right? What is this what is this quantity? Well, that's like saying I take this special function and I sample it at k omega zero, right? That's this number, right? 
would be x k omega 0, e to the j k omega 0 t. And then if I think about what, what I'm summing up, right, I'm summing up this guy at equally spaced multiples of omega 0, right? And each of these guys gets multiplied by omega 0, right? The width of this is omega 0. So I can think of each of the terms in this sum as being the area of a rectangle, right? The width of the rectangle is omega 0. The height of the rectangle is this continuous function sampled at k omega 0, right? So what I'm really doing here is I'm summing up the areas of these rectangles, okay? And this should start to kind of ring a bell from the mists of calculus one about how you define integrals, right? So the way I originally defined an integral way back when was by approximation with these boxes. We call that a Riemann sum, right? And as you take the boxes narrower and narrower, eventually you get things that add up to exactly the integral, right? So right now, these boxes are not a great approximation of the integral because there's so much overshoot. But if I were to reduce omega zero, right, then the thing inside the sum, this sum converges to the integral. And so again, the way I think about this is what I want to do anyway to get my approximation of the Fourier transform is I want to make t really, really big. That means making omega zero really, really small. And so now what I'm going to do is uh, take the limit of both sides, right? So now what I learned was that I have this on the left-hand side and this on the right-hand side. And now what I'm going to do is take the limit as omega goes to zero of both sides, right? So let's refresh our memory. The left-hand side is this, right? So the limit as okay, the limit as omega goes to zero is just this original aperiodic signal, right? That corresponds to pushing the copies infinitely far away. And so my left-hand side is going to become x of t. My right-hand side is going to become that integral. Okay, so let me write down what I learned. I learned that x of t on left-hand side equals 1 over 2 pi times this integral of that function, x of omega e to the j omega t, and then that becomes d omega. And this is exactly the Fourier transform. So let's remember, let's recap what I wrote. I wrote this for the forward part, and I defined this for the other way. And this is exactly the Fourier transform, right? So now I've derived what I can do in the case of continuous signals, right? So this is the kind of uh, Fourier transform that tells me how to go from the time domain to the omega domain. And this is the inverse Fourier transform that tells me how to go backwards. And we just proved that these two things make sense. I can go forward and I can go backwards for any finite length aperiodic signal, right? Okay, so this is great. This is the derivation of the Fourier transform. That's where I wanted to get to, right? And so what we learned is that if I have x of t being a continuous function, if it's periodic, what I get is the Fourier series, which has a discrete set of a k. And if it's not periodic, I get the Fourier transform, which has a continuous x of omega. Okay. So that's great. And this is basically, you know, the two cases, either it's periodic or it's not. And so in the next, you know, a couple weeks we're going to generalize this to what happens when x of t is discrete or digital, right? That this is of course on DSP. It turns out that there are basically digital equivalents to both of these things, right? And so we're going to learn what the other two things are. And th that's probably something that you didn't learn in signal systems. Okay. All right. So let me pause and ask if there are any questions. Okay. Yes. Question. 
Yeah, so I, I basically got to the Fourier transform by taking my non-periodic signal, pretending it was periodic with a very large T, and pushing those copies out to infinity. Other questions? OK, so again, just like last time, let me make a quick note about um, when is this legal? Like, when does it actually work? And the rules are basically similar to uh, the Fourier series. One is that I should have an integral where this energy converges, right? I have a finite energy signal. We had a similar condition for the Fourier series. And actually, there was a question last time about, you know, what happened if I had some sort of crazy signal that had asymptotes but still had a finite integral under the asymptote? I think that you could do the Fourier series with that. I don't think there's anything preventing you from doing that, although I think it would look really weird. So we'd have to actually experiment to see what it looked like. But I think it can be done. The second one is basically having a finite number of extrema, maxima and minima. And that's kind of like the equivalent of it not wiggling infinitely much. And the third one is it has to have a finite number of discontinuities. And so these are basically the same things. In, in, in some sense, when you think about it, the Fourier series and the Fourier transform are really the same thing. I mean, the Fourier series is kind of like a uh, special case of the Fourier transform in some sense. So, I mean, it's not surprising that I basically get the same kinds of rules. Um, we make a special case exception. We do allow ourselves, um, you know, exception. We do allow the Fourier transform of periodic signals. Right? So, for example, I could have a signal like this. Right? It has a Fourier series, but I could also allow myself to take the Fourier transform of it with the understanding that, you know, the integral under this signal, right, is going to be infinity. Right? So, this is one special case where I let my first condition slide. What the first condition really means is that I can't have a signal like this that is aperiodic and infinite area squared, right? Um, so we're going to talk about this guy in just a second. OK. So let's take some actual Fourier transforms of things. And so unfortunately, I don't think that I can avoid talking about the delta function in continuous time just for a few days. So basically, since the prerequisite for this is signal systems, we talked about the delta function, which is basically thought of as a impulse in continuous time that has an infinite height, but I mean, I've got to put this in quotes because it's a little bit slangy, infinite height and unit area, right? So when I integrate over this impulse, I get one. But in some sense, that impulse is infinitely high. And so we need to, do, we need to know about this because we need the delta function for some of the properties and stuff we're going to talk about next. And so my x of omega, if I just plug in my definition, is going to be this integral, x of t e to the minus j omega t dt, which is just basically saying what happens when I integrate with the delta function. Well, the integral basically corresponds to looking at the places where the delta function is firing and plugging in that value of t here. So I just get e to the j omega times 0. And that corresponds to 1, right, for all omega. So the Fourier transform of the delta function is constant. What happens if we shift the delta function? Well, all that's going to happen is that it's like shifting where does this delta function fire, 
Now instead of firing at zero, it fires at t naught. And so this is going to be e to the j omega t naught. Okay. And again, you know, one way I think about this is that these functions have the same magnitude, right? Because this is just some point on the unit circle, but they have different phase. The intuition, just like with Fourier series, say when I time shift the signal, I phase shift, I phase shift the Fourier series coefficients in the same way I phase shift the Fourier transform. I'm not really changing the contribution of things. All I'm doing is changing when these cosines and sines start. Okay. And then from these, I can build up, well, what happens if I have sums of delta functions? So if I have, you know, a delta function here and a delta function here, at plus t naught and minus t naught, well, this guy is going to go to um, e to the j omega t naught, and this guy is going to go to e to the minus j omega t naught, which is going to be like two cosine of omega t naught. So when I have two impulses like this, I get a cosine, and hopefully you remember that when we were doing things in signals and systems, we used these kinds of two, co two cosine things to get things like amplitude modulation, right? If we wanted to push copies of the signal back and forth, we multiplied things by cosines. And so you see this a lot in modulating scenarios. And if I wanted to, you know, make this a little more precise, so here these delta functions are of height one. Conventionally, what I do is I make these guys have a height of half, and then the Fourier transform of this is just the cosine. So I get rid of that factor of two. Okay, so one that you see a lot is this guy, e to the minus a t u of t, right? That's like a, and let's just say a is greater than zero. That's like a sinus or like an exponential that turns on at zero and is decreasing. And the integral of this squared is finite, and so I could take the Fourier transform of it. What I get is x of omega is equal to this integral. I have e to the minus a t u of t e to the minus j omega t dt. The u of t turns the integral into zero to infinity. And then I have e to the minus a plus j omega t dt. And again, if I kind of treat this like it's a normal real valued integral, what I can get is minus 1 over a plus j omega evalu evalu oops, times e to the minus a plus j omega t. Evaluated t equals infinity, t equals 0. When I plug in t equals infinity, since a is positive, this thing goes to 0, right? It's like a to some really big negative e to some really big negative number. So I get 0, and then I plug in 0, e to that 0 is 1, so I just get 1 over a plus j omega. And again, if you've done Fourier transform problems in the past, you remember all these 1 over a plus j omegas floating around, and then you have to do partial fractions, blah, 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 right? In the same way, as we're going to talk about, um, I guess I'm not going to talk about the Laplace transform in this class, but the Laplace transform, you know, is kind of similar, where instead of j omega here, I'd have an s, right? And that, that's because the Laplace transform, or the, that's because the Fourier transform is like the Laplace transform evaluated along the j omega axis when the ROC includes the j omega axis, right? So again, all this stuff is really tied together. And in some sense, you could imagine that the, you know, just like the Fourier transform is more general than the Fourier series, the Laplace transform is more general than the Fourier transform, right? And that's why we spent so much time on the Laplace transform in signals and systems. Okay, so let me just ask questions about any of this so far. Okay, so one signal that is really important is the pulse. Not repeated, just a regular pulse. So let's suppose I have this guy. Okay. Well, x of omega, again, I'm just going to plug in. This turns into a very simple integral the integral from minus t1 to t1 of e to the minus j omega t dt. And again, I treat this like 
this, just doing the integral. And I plug in, what do I get? I get minus one over j omega times e to the minus j omega t1 minus e to the plus omega j t1. And I can identify this as basically a sine function in here, right? So what I would have is, this is like saying I have two times sine of omega t1, and I have an extra omega floating around. And I can immediately simplify this and say, okay, well, this is like saying I have two t1 sine omega t1 over omega t1, which is the same as saying I have two t1 sinc omega t1. Again, should be a familiar result that a pulse in the time domain corresponds to a sinc function in the frequency domain. And as we're going to see, vice versa, right? And so again, I can kind of look back. Let me just actually think about this for just a second. Let's plot what is this uh, you know, sync function look like. Uh -oh. So what does sync omega look like? Well, this is like one of omega one over omega times sine of omega. Right? So what does one over omega look like? Well, one over omega looks like this, at least for positive omega. And what does sine look like? Sine looks like, um, you know, this. And when I multiply these two things together, what I get is it looks like I have the 1 over omega envelope, and that kind of modulates or multiplies the sine. So it's kind of like I have the same sine wave, and it's oscillating inside here. One thing that's not really clear is what happens at um, zero, right? The sine is zero, but the one over omega is infinite, right? So it's unclear what I get. And how I could solve that is the theorem that I'm forgetting the name of, where you take the derivative of, what is it? L'Hopital's rule, yes. So L'Hopital's rule shows you that the value here is actually one, right? And so what I see is something like this. And even though this is kind of lopsided, what I can see is that when does the signal cross zero, right? Well, it crosses it in the same places that sine crosses zero, right? So when is sine zero? It's zero at pi, it's zero at two pi, and so on. So they, basically, these guys are like multiples of pi. And then when I look at my actual function that I get from the Fourier transform, the fact that I'm scaling inside the sync function means that fundamentally I'm changing where those zeros occur. So now those zeros are going to be basically functions of T1. So when I scale things for this guy, these guys are going to become like pi over uh, T1 and 2 pi over T1 and so on. Okay, so we showed that the Fourier transform of the pulse was the sink. What happens if we have a pulse in the frequency domain? So we didn't do any kind of inverse Fourier transforms yet. So what if x of omega looks like a pulse? Let's suppose that it has a width of w and a height of 1. Okay. So then x of t is going to be 1 over 2 pi times this integral. d omega, right? And I'm going to get basically the same kind of integral, right? I'm going to go from minus w to w of e to the j t omega, this time d omega. So I'm going to get 1 over j t with a 2 pi here, evaluated from omega equals w to omega equals minus w, and I'm going to get 1 over pi t times 1 over 2j 
e to the j t w minus e to the minus j t w. And I can immediately see this is a sine function, so I get sine t w over pi t, which is just another kind of sinc function, right? So what I get is w over pi sinc of t w. Right, so kind of what we showed was that I had a, you know, if I have time and frequency, right, so what I had in the time domain was a pulse. In the frequency domain, I got a sync. If I had a pulse in the frequency domain, I got a sync in the time domain. And so this is not a coincidence. This is what's called duality, right? And you can show why there is a relationship between what happens in the time domain and what happens in the frequency domain. That applies basically to any pair of signals that you come across. So for example, just like we showed that in the time domain we had a delta function, in the frequency domain we got a constant. In a similar way, in the frequency domain, if we have a constant, or I'm sorry, the frequency domain we have a delta function, in the time domain we have a constant, right? Maybe it's better to say this. The constant is not exactly one in the time domain, there's always this kind of 2 pi floating around that makes a constant offset between these things. But the shapes of the signals are what match, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get across here. So just in the same way, I've got you know, a pair of impulses in the time domain corresponding to a cosine in the frequency domain, in the same way a cosine in the time domain corresponds to a pair of impulses in the frequency domain. Hopefully all this is not too unfamiliar. OK, so comments or questions? All right, so I mentioned that I am allowed to do the Fourier transform of signals that are periodic. So far, none of this stuff has been periodic, right? So what happens if I have a periodic signal? So what if x of t is periodic? So we can take either the Fourier series or the Fourier transform. And so, you know, intuition tells us that those things should be very closely related, right? So let's suppose that I have um, let's see here, something like this. Let's see. Trying to think whether I'll give you the general thing first or the. Well, let's just do the general thing. Okay, so let's suppose that I have a signal that is a bunch of delta functions. I think we need to let that guy in. Thank you. Okay, so these delta functions, let's suppose that they are. Give it a good push. It's, it's vacuum sealed. Okay, so this is kind of a weird signal, but as it turns out, it's going to come up later, so that's why I'm doing it now. This is like what we would call an impulse train. Okay. Just as a preview, the reason that I'm looking at the signal now is this signal is related to what we need to do when we talk about the sampling theorem. Right? So in some sense, when I sample uh, a non-periodic signal, what I'm doing is I'm multiplying it by the impulse train. And the, uh, you know, the t basically tells me what my sampling rate is. Okay. okay, so here's this impulse train. Now, I could do the Fourier series of this signal, right? So basically, this signal has period t. What I would do for the Fourier series would be uh, compute my ak. as 1 over t times this integral, x of t e to the minus j k 2 pi over t t dt. Again, I'm going to plug the delta function in here. Within this region, the only place that delta function fires is at 0, where the value is 1. 
And so that's exactly the same as evaluating this function here at zero. So basically I get one over t, and that's gonna be true for all k. Right? So even for the k equals zero term, because the average value of the signal is, you know, it, it, if I integrate over one period, I get one divided by the width of the period is t, right? So what I get is that the impulse train gives me constant Fourier series coefficients, okay? Um, and on the other hand, I can look at my, uh, you know, my Fourier transform and I could say, okay, well, what would the Fourier transform be? I have a feeling I'm going to get myself into trouble here because I didn't practice this example. Well, I'm going to put my delta functions in here. And now again, by the same kind of reasoning, what I'm going to get is, uh, well, this is basically just going to fire at these guys here. Somehow I feel like I screwed this up. I don't like this where this went. It went to a bad place. So let's see, how did I get this screwed up? All right, I guess I got myself into trouble here. Let me go back one step. So forget this. For a second. Should still work, but I'm confused about what I wanted to do. So what I wanted to say was, let's start more general. I want to come back to that because I feel like I should be able to figure out what I did wrong. So let's suppose that x of t is a periodic signal. So it can be represented as x of t is this sum. page in my notes here, which is why I'm confusing myself. What I want to get to is that the Fourier transform of this thing is basically related to these Fourier series coefficients. I guess what I was trying to say was, okay, so here's, here's where I wanted to start. So let's suppose we have a signal whose Fourier transform looks like this. So I'm going to basically give myself a whole bunch of impulses. The only thing about these impulses is that they need to be spaced apart by omega zero. 
So this is a function of omega. This is my x of omega. That is to say, my x of omega looks like the sum of 2 pi times whatever the height of the impulse is times the delta function spaced out at multiples of omega 0. Okay. So this is where I'm starting. This is my assumption. This is what my Fourier transform is. Now, what I would do is I would figure out, okay, I'm going to plug this in and figure out what is the corresponding time domain signal. What is the corresponding x of t? Okay. Well, the key thing is understanding what is the inverse Fourier transform of this shifted delta function. Right? Well, suppose we just have this, delta of omega minus k omega 0. The corresponding x of t is 1 over 2 pi times this integral e to the j omega t d omega which is just going to be 1 over 2 pi times e to the j plugging in the omega where the delta function fires. Right? So again, a kind of frequency shift in the frequency domain corresponds to this phase shift in the time domain. And so if I look back at what I have here, the Fourier transform of this whole thing is going to be, so for x omega equals the sum of 2 pi a k times these guys, my x of t, the 2 pi's are going to cancel out. What I'm going to get is the a k's times these time domain signals, which is exactly the Fourier series of x of t for a periodic signal with t equals 2 pi over omega 0. Right? So this kind of went backwards from what I wanted to do. What I kind of showed was that if I have a series of impulses, which may or may not be the same height over in the frequency domain, if those impulses are equally spaced, when I take that back in the time domain, what I get is a periodic signal. And in fact, I can interpret the heights of these impulses as being, you know, I can kind of read off Fourier series coefficients from the heights of those impulses, right? And so where I was trying to get to with the, um, so let's, let's take it as an example. So for example, let's suppose that I saw uh, this in the Fourier domain. Okay. So this is like an impulse, you know, train where I'm basically saying, okay, well, at uh, mega equals zero, I have zero. At omega equals you know, plus or minus omega zero, I have a delta function of height pi. And then at omega equals plus or minus k omega zero for k greater than one, I basically have again zero. And the idea was now I'd say, okay, well, I'm going to treat this like two pi times some Fourier series coefficient. And so here I'd say that means that my a0 is 0. My a plus or minus 1 is equal to 1 half, right? That's what I would get if these heights were pi. And the a plus or minus k would be equal to 0 for k greater than 1, right? And so now I put that back together into Fourier series, and that tells me that my x of t is 1 half times 
e to the j, what is my omega zero here? Well, it's just generally omega zero, plus one half e to the minus j omega zero t. And I have no other Fourier series terms, right? And this is just the same thing as cosine omega zero t, right? So this kind of reconfirms what I already knew, right? I knew that when I had a cosine in one domain, I got the two impulses in the other domain, right? And so here, this is like saying I can take the cosine, I can compute the Fourier series of it, and then I can put those Fourier series coefficients on top of these impulses and get the Fourier transform. Right. And so what I was trying to do with my crummy delta function example was we showed that um, for uh, a periodic impulse train with period uh, t, we showed that the Fourier series coefficients were constant, right? That's what I showed a couple of slides ago. And so the Fourier transform of this signal Well, let's apply our reasoning here, right? This is like saying that I'm going to get impulses that are 2 pi times this thing high, and they're going to be spaced apart by omega 0. And my omega 0 is just 2 pi over t. So my corresponding frequency domain interpretation is going to be 2 pi over t, 2 pi over t times 2, and so on. This is basically my omega zero, two omega zero, and so on. And the heights of my impulses are going to be two pi over t, right? One over t because those were the Fourier series values, and two pi because I have to multiply them by two pi by the thing I proved earlier. And so where you get is that can find my original page here. What you get is that if I have this guy in the time domain, right, impulse train where the impulses are spaced apart by capital T, what I have in the frequency domain is also an impulse train where the impulses are spaced apart by 2 pi over T. So basically, the wider the impulses are over here, the closer they are together over here. And actually, that kind of makes sense because you know the wider the impulses are here, it's like saying if I take t getting really, really large, it's like pushing it so it's not periodic at all, right? So eventually, I just have one impulse in the middle and nothing else. And the corresponding thing that would happen over here would be that these guys would all push together so closely that they become a constant, right? Because I know a delta function in the time domain corresponds to constant in the frequency domain. So all the reasoning kind of stands together. I should think about why I kind of muffed that explanation on the other side, but I don't want to distract myself too much. So, okay. So, I sorry, I apologize for the clumsiness of that explanation, but uh, does that kind of come together a little bit? What I want to kind of convey is, just to recap, that if I have a signal, I know the Fourier series of it, right? The Fourier transform of it is just the same Fourier series coefficients perched on top of impulse functions in the frequency domain, right? So, instead of having a nice continuous uh, frequency domain, what I have instead are delta functions, and the heights of those delta functions correspond to Fourier series coefficients. Because one of the things I want to do throughout the first couple weeks here is kind of keep on drawing the connections between the different types of Fourier and Z stuff that you can do, right? Because all this stuff is really different ways of looking at the same type of transform. It's good to be able to kind of mentally switch back and forth and say, okay, so what should I get if I have a periodic signal and I chose to take the Fourier transform instead? Okay, so questions, comments, tomatoes. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about something a little bit easier, which is just recapping of Fourier series property or Fourier transform properties, right? So again, I'm not going to go through these in great detail. You're going to be able to use them on the homework without having to prove anything. I just want to make sure that we remember the basic ideas, right? So. 
Fourier transform properties. I just had an insight as to how I could have gotten the answer where I wanted to. Let's just go back to this for just one second, just so I feel like I redeemed myself a little bit. So, where did I get stalled? I get stalled on this, right? And so, the thing that I didn't remember, right, was that these guys, I also lost an omega somewhere, right? These guys. So what these guys are, are fundamentally um, a bunch of complex exponentials on the on the Fourier side, right? And so again, just in the same way that uh, if I have an e to the j uh, omega zero t here corresponds to a delta function over here, in the same way if I have an e to the j t zero omega, that's going to shift back to a delta function over here, multiplied by some constant, right? So then the idea is that the corresponding uh, guy here, the x of t, should turn into a whole bunch of, you know, sums of t minus kt's, right? That's where I would get back the impulse train here, but anyway. forget I said that. All right, so Fourier transform properties. Let's revisit our formulas here. So the forward Fourier transform is this guy. The inverse Fourier transform is this guy. Okay. Just as a quick comment, so sometimes you will see people talking about, um, you will see this represented sometimes as x of j omega instead of x of omega. Um, like if you look in the single sex book, I know that they like to do that. I find this, this uh, notation kind of too confusing, right? The reason that they do this is that because we also know that there's the Laplace transform, right? And so if I plug in the imaginary axis s equals j omega, that's why I can kind of think about the Fourier transform as, you know, j omega. But I always prefer thinking about this as omega because I really want to plot omega as, you know, the frequency variable, right? I want to be, I want to be able to make plots that look like this, omega and x of omega. So, Again, if you look at other references, you may find j omegas instead of just regular omegas, but that's the way I like to do it. Okay, so one property I've already kind of used already um, is linearity, right? So these things kind of get inherited from the Fourier series. So if I have a couple of signals that if I put in the natural combination of signals over here, I get the natural combination of signals over there. Right? So the Fourier transform is a linear operator. Uh, in fact, I probably already implicitly used this a bunch of times when I was taking the Fourier transforms earlier. Otherwise, nothing would have worked when I looked at sums. I also kind of used um, time shift property. Right, so if I take a signal and I shift it, the thing that happens to its Fourier transform is a phase shift, right? So the magnitude, you know, note that the magnitude of this thing is the same as whatever the magnitude was before. So all I'm doing is I'm shifting the phase of the sinusoids in the integral that I add up, I'm not really shifting any of the important content. Okay. okay. Um, there are a bunch of properties, and so especially for the um, graduate level problems, you know, there are a bunch of symmetry properties of the Fourier transform that's kind of good to, to know. And so, for example, um, I'm just going to kind of lump all this stuff under symmetry properties. So let's suppose that I have x of omega is equal to a real part plus an imaginary part. 
Okay. So if x of t is real, then I have some properties that tell me that the real part is even, and then imaginary part is odd. And that kind of is the same kind of thing that we showed earlier, where if I knew that the periodic signal was real, that there was this relationship between A1 and A minus 1 being complex conjugates of each other, that's like the generalization to this, right? So the real part is even, the imaginary part is odd. You can also show that the magnitude of x omega is even, and the angle of x omega is odd. And for that reason, since oftentimes we deal with real signals, you know, this tells us that, for example, I don't have to plot the Fourier transform for all values of omega. Since the magnitude is even, you usually see plots that look like this, where I just have omega, magnitude, and I make a plot like this. I don't bother plotting the stuff on the left-hand side because I know it's just mirror image across the y-axis. Okay. Some more subtle symmetry properties are things like this. So you can show that um, the even part of x of t is what corresponds to the real part of x of omega, and that the odd part of x t is what corresponds to the imaginary part of x omega. And so by those kinds of things, you can say that, okay, so if x of t is real and even, that x of omega is also real and even. And you can show that if x of t is real and odd, then x of omega is purely imaginary and odd. And these kind of stem from the facts that I showed here earlier, right? So basically, I know that the real part and the imaginary part are innately even and odd, and I know that things like um, when the signal's even, you can show that basically what's happening here is that um, you know the real part of x leads to the x of omega being even, and the fact that this is even leads to this, right? So you can kind of show that the combination of these properties let you make some conclusions about the Fourier transform. And so the um, homework problems for the graduate students are exploiting some of these properties, right? So I mean, you can show some simple things about a signal without actually having to compute the Fourier transforms if you understand the relationship between the even parts and the odd parts. Actually, I think there is even a problem for the undergraduates on this. I think problem four has to do with saying, okay, I've got this signal, and um, you know there is an even part and an odd part. I should know that those map onto the real part of the Fourier transform and the imaginary part of the Fourier transform. Okay. So we kind of have the usual um, differentiation and integration, the same kinds of things that came from the Fourier series. And so, for example, if I have the derivative of a signal, you can easily show that the Fourier transform of that is just j omega times x of omega. And again, just as a reminder from the Laplace world, this is like saying that when I take the derivative of a signal, I get an extra s, right? Same kind of thing here. And when I integrate a signal, so say I integrate a signal up to time t, what I get is 1 over j omega x of omega. And there's just a little extra bit here that could happen at omega equals 0. This corresponds to uh, there could be a DC offset that you get when you do the integration. Um, you know, there's a bunch of other kind of boring ones, basically saying things like time scaling 
So if I scale the signal, what I get is a scaled version of the Fourier transform going the other way. So basically, if I shrink the time domain signal, I spread out the frequency domain signal and vice versa. Um, and then, you know, duality I mentioned earlier, the kind of thing saying that if I have, you know, a pulse in one world and it corresponds to a sink in the other world, that if I have a pulse over here, it corresponds to a sink over here, right? So it's just kind of like, you know, if it happens in one domain and you know it happens in the other domain, you can switch them and be sure that's going to work out. You can usually prove that as just basically like a simple change of variables. Not hard to do. And so just in the same way, duality implies that all the properties I just wrote down also kind of apply to the other variables, right? So for example, if I was to look at a time shift, right? So if I look at, uh, you know, if I wanted to shift time in, if I wanted to shift the frequencies, say like x of omega minus omega zero, that would correspond to a, you know, multiplying the time domain by a complex phase, right? Okay. We have the same kinds of things like Parseval. This says that the integral, you know, the total energy in the time domain is basically the same except for this 2 pi factor of the total energy in the frequency domain. Right? So basically I have the same total energy in either way. I don't lose anything. And the key principle which I'm going to talk about, I think, more next time, is, you know, convolution. So the key principle is convolution. That basically says that if y of t is x of t convolved with h of t, then y of omega is x of omega, h of omega, right? And that part is really important, right? This basically says that if I have an LTI system and I put it through, I put a signal through something that has a certain impulse response, and a, kind of an equivalent way of representing this system is with the frequency response, right? We're gonna talk about this more next time. So the idea is that if I have the impulse response, the Fourier transform of that is called the frequency response. And as you know, multiplying things together in the frequency domain and taking the inverse Fourier transform is generally a lot easier than manually doing the time domain convolution, right? And so um, that really turns the whole signal processing thing on its head from if we didn't know anything about the, the frequency domain, you know, we would be like, okay, this suddenly makes all of my frequency domain or all of my uh, LTI system life much easier. And so that's what I think I want to focus on next time is talking about the relationship between the Fourier transform and how we use it in practice to solve linear systems, okay? So again, most of our systems in this class are gonna be discrete time, so I just wanna take one more class to talk about continuous time Fourier transform, solid continuous time LTI systems, and then after that, we're gonna be doing all sorts of discrete stuff. So what I wanna do next after that is talk to you about the discrete time Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform, which are similarly named, but are basically the corresponding entities to the Fourier transform in the Fourier series. Okay, so any questions or comments? All right, let me just uh, shut myself down here.